from the Republic of Fishuk. I'm Hayley and this is my husband Brian Gallagher and we get to be your church MCs for today. So first up we have Jacob Egba who's going to be sharing a little bit about his ministry. He's our church elder and he's recently been appointed the AIM missions mobilizer and he's going to be um, sharing a little bit about what that ministry looks like and um, how we as a church can support him in different ways. So We'll leave it there. So now's a good time to finish off your breakfast and get all your distractions out of the way so we can really focus in on what the Lord has in store for us today. Hi, Connectors family. My name is Jacob Igba, husband to Juliet, dad to Zedek and Jerry, missionary with Africa Inland Mission. I'm so excited and glad to share with you an exciting opportunity the Lord is placing before us in our mission journey. Um, recently, Africa Inland Mission appointed us into a new role, and that role is called Southern Africa Mobilizing Coordinator. And that's, that's a lot of words there, but it's sort of descriptive of what the Lord is placing before us to step forward and do. Um, for me, this sits very well with a sense of personal calling and passion, uh, because it reminds me of many years ago, um, attending a, a leaders meeting in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia where about 400 African church leaders gathered together in a room praying and strategizing about mission. And I came out of that place with a personal sense of calling to contribute towards moving this continent from a mission field to a mission force. That's big, that's huge, but just a sense of contributing in some way to making that happen. And so for me, Africa Inland Mission releasing us to become mobilizing coordinators for Southern Africa just sits so well with that personal sense of vision and calling. Um, what that means practically is that uh, we're going to be released. We have to leave Cape Town, beautiful Cape Town. Um, Strategically, we're going to be setting up office in Johannesburg so that from there we can launch into Southern African countries and further into Africa. And basically what we're going to be doing in, by, you know, by the name of mobilizing is to work with churches, Christian leaders and theological institutions to contribute towards having a better understanding of mission through offering training and equipping so that um, churches and leaders and theological institutions will, will embrace a vision for mission that helps people to see mission as something that is not just around their neighborhood, but could spread further to their nation and then to nations. Uh, that's very critical in my mind, especially in this continent that is really, really growing and have a critical role to play in what the shape of Christianity will look like in future. So that's what the Lord is calling us into. And um, the church, Connect Church, is behind us in this. African Land Mission is behind us. And I like to call you to be uh, part of us and be part of our support structure, be part of our praying structure, because every missional activity is spiritual warfare. And so we're stepping into further spiritual warfare, taking this mission mobilizing vision into Africa, into Southern Africa. Uh, please consider being part of our support team in praying, in supporting, in encouraging, um, so that the Lord will just use us in contributing to moving Africa from a mission field to a mission force. God bless you. Bye -bye. Hello, my name is Brian, and if you haven't met me yet, I'm from Liverpool and this is why I have my lovely wife as wife and interpreter, uh, just in case you need. But um, so we, we, we're going to go straight into a time of worship and then we're going to go into uh, a second sermon of the series on Breaking Point uh, and Pastor Brad is going to give that. Um, so let's just prepare our hearts right now um for a time of worship and also let's just enter into in, into prayer before all of that okay 
Yeah, Father God, we, we just thank you for this morning, Lord, and, and that we can just so freely enter into your presence, Lord. And we thank you that you, you love us, Lord, that we don't need to have done anything, Lord, but you love us all the same. And we just offer our hearts to you and we come to you in, in prayer uh, and adoration this morning. And we, Lord, we just want to, we want to worship you. Um, Lord, would you, would you, uh, yeah, just prepare our hearts and, 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 and our minds as well, just as we receive your word uh, through Brad. We pray that you would be with him, help him to, to, to deliver your word, Lord, to, to, to speak into our lives. And yeah, just that, that we would be so attentive to what you have to say for us uh, and to us, Lord. Yeah, so we just, uh, we just welcome you and we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. There's nothing worth more. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare your olive Your presence, Lord I've tasted and seen Of the sweetest of loves When my heart becomes clean And my shame is undone Your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for To be overcome by your presence, Lord In your presence, Lord So let us let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness let us become more aware of your presence let us experience the glory of your goodness let us become more aware of your presence let us experience the glory of your goodness in your presence Lord in your presence Holy Spirit come fill our hearts fill our minds fill this place oh God, I look to you, 
I won't be overwhelmed Give me vision To see things like you do And God, I look to you You where my help comes from Give me wisdom You know just what to do And I will love you Everything is meaningless, says the teacher, completely meaningless. What do people get for all their hard work under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth never changes. Ecclesiastes 1 verses 2 to 4. 
Today we're going to take some time to talk about time, work, family and rest. We're going to take time together to think about what we give our time to. Because what we choose to do with our time is one of the most important decisions that we'll make every day. We are also living in a unique space in history. For so long, life has just been business as usual. Unlike the admonition in James, we have lived our lives as though tomorrow is a certainty, that it will happen just like today did. And we make our plans, our schedule our meetings, we do our chores and we see our friends. And then out of nowhere, COVID came. And for the first time, in at least my knowledge in the history of South Africa, we went into a lockdown. The consequences and the implications of the COVID pandemic have been many and they've been varied. And as a church family, we've experienced them to greater and lesser degrees. Many of us painfully so, and they've been incredibly, incredibly difficult. And yet for all of us, COVID very clearly did at least one thing. It reset our normal. It recreated a new baseline. On the 26th of March last year, Cyril Ramaphosa told our nation, bar some essential services like our medical professionals, to stop. Stop driving around. Stop going to work. Stop going to school. Stop seeing friends. Stop going out. Stop going to church. Just stop. As a country, we endured a forced reset. Everything that was normal for us was put on hold and we were given a new reality within which we had to live. Now, sure, many of us had to scramble at the beginning of that to adapt ourselves, to adapt our business practices, to set up new protocols of operation in order to navigate this new world that we found ourselves in. But by and large, that which was normal for us was frozen. And that break, that break was a critical moment for our nation. And I would contend for the whole world. It was as though God pushed the pause button on the movie of the human race. It is a moment in history where God forced a stop to the frantic pace of life and created an opportunity for the world to reflect. An opportunity to stop, to consider, to evaluate. An opportunity to ask, is this really how I want to live my life? And as we lived in this new reality, we were able to see so starkly the difference from the reality that was before. To compare that which had been normal to that which we were now forced to live in. I wonder how many of you, like me, felt something akin to a sense of relief in that comparison. How many of us, as we considered the old in light of the new, thought, you know what? This is actually a lot more manageable. In fact, apart from the fact that my income is like really uncertain and I can't see anyone, which really sucks. There are some things I could really appreciate in this new way of living. I mean, all the introverts that are listening right now are like, can we, can we all please just go back to lockdown level five? Like that would be really great. Thanks. And we're okay with that. Uh, we're not we're not all like you, you um, but but some of you are feeling that way. Yet as we've come out of lockdown, I wonder how many of us felt that sense of relief. And at, and those of us who did feel that sense of relief, how many of us as as we've come come out now, how many of us feel ourselves sliding back into that old way of living, where our schedules are full again, where we have to plan to see people weeks in advance, or it just doesn't happen where the margin that COVID forcibly introduced into our lives is being slowly squeezed out again and the treadmill is starting to speed up once more. Today we're going to talk a bit about how we spend our time and what those choices might tell us about our hearts and what we need to do with that information. We're going to ground ourselves primarily in Matthew chapter 6. Because here in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus begins to address the ideas that we're concerned about today. Time, money, and the heart behind them. In verses 19 to 21 of Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says this. He says, Don't store up treasures here on earth, where moths will eat them and rust will destroy them, and where thieves break in and steal. 
Store your treasure in heaven, where moths and rust cannot destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. On the surface, this appears to be a simple instruction about stuff. Jesus is telling us not to acquire too much of it. But it goes a little bit deeper than that. Jesus uses the word treasure here intentionally because treasure has has heart and, and motive attached to it. It's a more descriptive word than possessions. Treasure has value attached to it. It's something we feel affection toward. It's something that we safeguard. And it's this heart attitude that Jesus is really wanting to address. Because if your treasure was simply possessions, it would be something that you could easily give up, right? Think of the rich young ruler and the challenge that Jesus leveled against him. But but when our possessions are treasure, they're not so easily relinquished as that ruler found. And so in this short saying, Jesus does three things. The first is that he warns us about attaching our affection to the temporary stuff that we acquire in life. And there's a whole message we could do on that if we wanted to. Right? The second is that he anticipates the call that we're going to see at the end of Matthew chapter 6, calling us to live and to work for that which has eternal significance. And this is an important idea that's going to carry through. And finally, Jesus creates a litmus test for us to be able to examine our own hearts. Looking at your treasure, Jesus says, will will tell you something about the desires of your heart. So let's take a moment to, to think about that for a second. Jesus is telling us that if we look at the things that we value, those things will reflect the true desire of our heart. This is kind of like a beep test. I don't know if any of you know what a beep test is. Maybe some of you have done a beep test. A beep test is designed to measure your level of cardio fitness. And right? what they do is they put up beacons that are set number of meters apart. And, and you have to run from one beacon to the next, backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. And there's a, there's a timer. And the timer beeps when you run out of time to get from the one beacon to the other. And when you start the the time between beeps is reasonably long. And uh, the longer you keep running from one beacon to the other, the shorter the time between the beeps get until eventually you can't reach the one beacon before the timer beeps. And that's your level. The beep test is used to give you an indication of something that's difficult to, to quantify perfectly. It's difficult to say what is your exact level of fitness? Where does it rank in the fitness scale? But the beep test gives you an idea. In the same way, this test Jesus gives us helps us to be able to evaluate what's going on in our heart. Right? Now, I want you to follow me for a second because we're going to make a logic jump here in order to connect this idea that Jesus gives us to the way in which we spend our time. So, so here's starting point number one, step one. Jesus teaches us that looking at the things that we value shows us what our heart is like. Okay, straight out of Matthew chapter six. The things we value show us what our heart is like. That's the test. All right, here's step number two. We know that our true priorities are evidenced by the way in which we spend our time. This is something we all have to admit if we're honest. If we say that we really value our education, but we never commit the time to study for that education, then that claim of ours rings hollow. It doesn't make sense because if we really valued it, we would have given it the time that it needs. Conversely, if we spend three hours a day managing our fantasy football team and watching all the games and reading all the reports, it's fair to say that we really love and value football. So we can say with confidence that the things we give the most of our time to are the things that we value most. You with me? Those two foundations allow us to make this conclusion. How we spend our time shows us what our heart is like. You follow that? Huh? If we are looking at, if looking at the things we value shows us where our heart is, and the way in which we spend our time shows us what we really value, then the way in which we spend our time shows us our heart. That's the journey I, I want us to follow. So let's talk a little bit about how we should be spending our time. This is an idea I want to explore a little bit with you today. Um, We don't have a God-given breakdown for the perfect week. 
Right? That would be great if the Lord had given that to us. Book of Timetables, Chapter 1, Monday. Right? That would have been awesome. That would have been real simple. Right? But that's not what we have. Instead, we have principles that we can draw out of the scriptures that guide us into how we should use our time. And I've, I've drawn five principles out that I want to share with you today that I think are helpful and important for us in understanding how God desires for us to use our time. The first two principles, they go together. Right? And they are work and Sabbath. When it comes to how we spend our time, perhaps the clearest instruction we're going to find in the scriptures is in Exodus chapter 20 from verses 8 to 10. This is the fourth of the Ten Commandments. God says, speaking from the cloud in glory, remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. There are two principles that are contained in these verses. First is the importance of the Sabbath. And I won't spend too long here because a few weeks ago, I spoke about the idea and the concept of Sabbath in our Exodus series. So please go have a look at that if you want to explore that. I think there's some really good stuff there. But I'll summarize with three comments. Right? God gave the Sabbath as a grace to mankind. That's number one. He created us to live within a rhythm of rest, which he made central to the functioning of the society of his people. And he intends us to live with a rhythm of rest because that's how he's made us. And the Sabbath was given in order to give us that grace, that rhythm, that rest. Secondly, that rest was meant to be complete. It wasn't meant to be a tiresome rest. That's why he gets quite specific about what you can and can't do on the Sabbath. Because a rest that leaves you more exhausted at the end of your rest than you were when you started is a useless rest. And God knew that. And so he, he explained that right up front in the Sabbath. And I think sometimes today as people, we are guilty of this. And we have this two-day weekend now instead of the one-day weekend. But we fill that weekend with so much stuff that you can often get to the end of Sunday and you're more tired than you were on Friday. So the Sabbath was meant to be a complete rest. Thirdly, the Sabbath was designed to recenter God's people on him, to bring him into the central focus of their lives. The principle of Sabbath is significant in looking at how we use our time. There should be a rhythm of rest that permeates our lives. It's how God has created us. The second principle I want to draw from the fourth commandment is this, and it's very simple. Work is good. God gave the majority of our week to be given to work. God endorses hard work and calls and expects his people to work. That's it. All right, those are the first two principles. Work, Sabbath. The third principle is family. When God set up Israelite society, he placed the family unit at the center. This underpins so much of how God created. Let's consider Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 to 9. Right? This isn't actually about family, but you can just see the context in this, in this passage. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you're on the road, when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your foreheads as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. When Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment was, he quotes this passage from Deuteronomy 6. But I want you to notice how this passage, the greatest command given to God's people of all time, lands in the context of family. The family unit was designed by God as the place where faith was to be built and reinforced. Families were to live out their faith together when they were at home or when they were out on the road, when they were going to bed or when they were waking up. This command assumes and intends for families to spend significant amount of time together. It highlights the value that God places on the family. And whilst this passage shows us the emphasis going from parent to child, 
There are other passages like Mark chapter 7 in verses 10 to 13 where Jesus shows how this value goes the other way around, from child to parent. The Lord values family. So should our time. Principle number four in the way we use our time is this. It's kingdom. Our time should be used for the kingdom. Because that is, after all, at the end of the day, fundamentally speaking, that is why you and I are alive. We exist for the kingdom of God. We exist for His glory, His purpose. In one of the most well-known passages of Scripture, the Great Commission, Matthew 28, Jesus makes this clear to his disciples. And unfortunately, in our English translations, we, we sometimes miss this because it's been rendered slightly differently and it doesn't bring out this distinction quite as clearly. We're used to reading the Great Commission that says, go and make disciples of all nations. And whilst that's not wrong, it seems to place the two verbs, go and make on equal footing, when in fact the one is subservient to the other. The main verb in Matthew chapter 28 is make disciples. Go is actually a participle. A better rendering of Jesus' instruction to his disciples is this, having gone, or in your going, or as you go, make disciples. The instruction shows us that the call of the kingdom, which is to make disciples, should form a part of our going. It should form a part of our daily lives. In other words, it's the call of the kingdom to make disciples should shape the way in which we spend our time, whether that time is at work or at home, at church or at play. It's all a part of our going. And the priority of the kingdom, the principle of the kingdom, the call to make disciples needs to be a part of all of those spaces. Finally, the fifth principle is the principle of church, the gathering together of believers. Acts chapter 2 verse 42 makes this statement about the very earliest church. It says, all the believers were devoted, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to the prayers. I want you to notice how all of those are corporate activities. The church the early church modeled for us how believers in the time of Jesus chose to use their time. They chose to devote themselves, to give themselves sacrificially. That's what the word devote means, to, to the groups of other believers. And this was the most successful time in the church's history. It's my contention that these five principles should inform how we use our time. And that when our time is being used well, these five principles are in balance with one another, each one receiving the time and attention that it deserves. So what happens when there's an imbalance? What happens when these priorities fall out of balance in our lives? Well then, friends, it's time to examine our hearts because then, as Jesus warned us, we've begun to chase after the wrong things. We started this message in Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to go back there now. Because shortly after teaching about the, our treasure and where, where our heart finds treasure, in verses 19 to 21, Jesus begins to talk about fear. So let's read together from verses 25 to 33. That is why I tell you, Jesus says, not to worry about your everyday life, whether you will have enough food or drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you more valuable to Him than they are? Can all of your worries add a single moment to your life? And why do you worry about clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing. And yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, He will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly father already knows all of your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything that you need. See friends, when we examine ourselves truly, and we discover there is an imbalance in the way in which we're spending our time, it's quite probable that we could be chasing the wrong thing. 
and behind that imbalance is some kind of fear. If you're spending too much time at your work, for example, is it possible that you've begun to chase wealth at the expense of your family, or at the expense of the church, or at the expense of the kingdom? Are you perhaps chasing success at the office where you can win accolades, promotions, and acclaim, rather than investing the time with your family where your contribution is less tangibly noticed? Instead of trusting God to meet your needs and to supply your daily bread, have you perhaps shouldered that responsibility yourself? Are you afraid that if you don't do it, someone else will drop the ball, or it won't get done, or you'll lose that client, or maybe even your job? Are you worried that if you don't do enough, you won't have enough to make it through the month? Are you afraid of having a conversation about boundaries with your boss because of the fallout that you expect? If you're wrestling with any of these questions, if, I, if as I say them, they, they call up memories, moments, things that happen maybe frequently, is it worth asking someone you love? if they feel like you're spending too much time at the office. Let's look at it another way. What if you're spending too much time at the church? Yes, this is a real thing. Although it's not one we pastors like to talk about often. If you're spending too much time at the church, is it possible that you're serving with the wrong motives? Are you seeking acclaim and the praise of people? Have you perhaps chosen to give more of your time and ministry to the church at the cost of your family? Are you worried about what your ministry leader might say if you told them you felt like you were burning out? Is there a problem at home that you're too afraid or too confused to deal with and so you avoid it by hiding in ministry? Are you afraid to put yourself out there in the big wild world because you might get hurt and it's safer to stay within the confines of the church? Questions to think about. What about the time we spend with our families? Is it possible for us to spend too much time there as well? If our imbalance falls too heavily here, is it perhaps because we're afraid that we've got nothing of value to give to the church or to the kingdom or to the world? Would we rather hide from people because to be honest, it's easier and you're not really sure you've got that much to give anyway? Are we afraid of stepping out and failing because we feel like we haven't got the skills or the gifts from God to use in the world around us? Have we become too afraid of other people and the chance of catching COVID that we've chosen to hide ourselves from them and we've denied the church and we've denied the kingdom access to our lives? I think this is a real question we have to ponder at the moment. It's a place where many of us have come out of the balance that God has called us to. Fear has crept in. But friends, the way in which we use our time is like a barometer of our heart. And when it goes out of balance, it's usually driven there because something has gone wrong in our hearts. And the question we've got to face is this. Are we prepared to give to God what we have and then trust Him to cover the rest? Because each of us only has 168 hours every week. We choose to invest those hours. How we choose to invest those hours is important. And each hour that is invested can never be reclaimed. Once it's in, it's in. At the end of the day, all the works of our hand are going to fade away like morning mist. And only that which we have sown that is eternal is going to remain. How are you going to choose? to use your time. And however you choose to use it, will you have faith to trust God with the rest? As I bring this message to a close today, you probably will find yourself in one of two places. Some of you might be hearing this and you already know there's a problem with your time distribution. It's something you may have been struggling with for some time and you're not even sure that there's a genuine way out. For you, the imbalance is, is further down the road. The burden has been getting heavier and heavier, and you're actually not much sure how much you're not sure how much longer you can sustain it. Perhaps your breaking point is not that far down the road. I want to say to you, if you are in this place, 
I'm going to pray specifically for you at the end. I'm going to ask God to come and to lead you into more balance in your life. But, but I think there needs to be a strategic decision that you make. You need to sit with the Lord and you need to recognize there are things that need to drop out. And I need to put other things in place. So I want to invite you to contact the church office. If you'd like to meet with one of the pastors personally, we are so willing to do that and to walk this road with you. Some of us, some of you might feel like you are living in balance. And for some of us who feel that way, this may be true. And I thank God for that. But for others, we might think it's true, but God actually knows we've started down the road of imbalance. And I pray that if we're on that place and in that place, that God would reveal that to us and give us grace to bring that into alignment. For all of us, I want to encourage you to continue to seek to keep your life and your time in balance. And invite others who you trust and who you know well to speak into the balance that they see in your life so that together we might become better at living in the fullness of life that God desires for us and for his kingdom. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you that we can come to you and we can trust you. Thank you that you're a God who loves us and cares for us. And Lord, I want to begin by praying specifically for those who, as they are listening to this message, whose lives are just out of balance, where certain areas of their life have just taken over and denied, you know, denied the other parts of their life that should be receiving the time they need, whether, they are, whether that's family relationships, whether that's the church, whether that's the kingdom, whether it's work, whether it's rest. Or what, whichever place is out of balance. Lord, I want to pray for your children who are in this place. And I want to pray, Jesus, for the revelation of the Spirit of God to bring light, to bring discernment, to bring insight, to be able to see that which is out of alignment. I want to pray for the courage, for the faith, and for the boldness to make the decisions that are necessary in order to bring that back into alignment. I want to pray that all the things that are distractions that would cloud the issue would be moved and removed away, God. And that there would be a grace to see clearly and to be able to choose wisely. Pray, Lord, for, for those who have just begun to walk into imbalance. Pray, Lord, for the grace of revelation to be able to see that and to catch it early, to not let it go too far. And to be able to move back into that place of balance. And Lord, I pray, I pray for all of us that you would give us grace to continue to walk in the balance of life that you desire for us. In the fullness and by the power of your Holy Spirit that you have given to us. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Friends, thank you so much for being with us today. May the Lord bless you and may he continue to give you grace as you seek to serve him in the 168 hours that he gives to you each week. Bye-bye. Thank you, Brad, for sharing with us. And thank you to you at home for joining in and allowing us to be your church MCs for the week. We will see you next week for our last sermon of the series Breaking Points and have a truly blessed week. Bye.